Will the series of stories that we worked on for a year lead to justice for the Monsignor? I don't know, but I do know that it has shined a glaring light on many shortcomings. Welcome back to Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles, a Lee Enterprises podcast. I'm your host, Nat Cardona. For the last few weeks, I've spent time sitting down with Buffalo News Watchdog team Dan Herbeck and Lou Michelle. They've picked apart just about every detail they could about the decades-old unsolved murder of Monsignor Francis O'Connor. On today's episode, we wrap things up with where the investigation stands now. Double back on any episodes that you missed to catch yourself up. But otherwise, let's go. We left on a pretty cliffhanger note, thanks to Lou last week. So (laughs) we got to pick up right where we left off. I mean, with the release of all these articles, you alluded to the fact that a lot of tips or extra information is rolled in in the past weeks, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to talk about it or no? I I can talk a little bit about it without going overboard. Since the stories have been completed, all 18 of them, and during it, we were receiving more responses from the public than at least in my 40-year career here uh, as a newspaper man, uh, I've re- I haven't received with other stories. And they include people who've had relatives who were over at Bemis Point, which the police described as a penal house for wayward priests. And one of those uh, individuals said her uncle came home on a brief leave from the facility, and he was all dinged up, black eyes, bruises on his face. And she recalled her mother citing a certain individual associated with discipline in the diocese. She said the name Kelleher. To this individual who was a child at the time, it... uh, she associated him with working with young people and his good, re- his stellar reputation in the diocese. Now, of course, we have no way of checking the validity of that, but the, the, the individual who sent us that email seemed very forthright. We, we've had a number of tips that have come in since the series was running. Some of them are very promising We wouldn't want to speak in detail about it at this point, but there are things we're looking into that really could unlock the mystery to this whole thing if we can find the right people to verify them. Lou and I have been convinced for the past year that there there are definitely people out there who know exactly what happened, know exactly why it happened, how it happened, and we just haven't been able to get those people to come forward. We've also had some people contact us with information that uh, corroborates things that we've already printed. Like I spoke to a, a retired policeman last night. He told me that there were two policemen that he was very close to. Uh, they're both deceased. They both retired many, many years ago. They had told him this story about uh, a priest they picked up one night in the downtown Buffalo area in the 1960s. He said they never told him why they picked the priest up, but they said he had he had engaged in some kind of misbehavior. They took this priest, as they were told, to, they took him to Monsignor Keller's uh, home. Monsignor Kelleher, when he opened the door, started screaming at the priest. And according to the cop I spoke to, he said uh, Kelleher, punched the priest in the face so hard he almost knocked him out and he started beating the heck out of this priest and the two police officers had to actually pull him off the priest Uh, that's how angry monsignor kelleher was at this priest and that really falls in the line with stories that we've heard from other officers and even retired priests and and people who had priests in their family the priests in Buffalo were scared to death of Monsignor Kelleher back in the 60s and 70s. I received a an email from somebody connected to law enforcement who recalled the time the Monsignor broke a man's Monsignor Kelleher broke a man's jaw over by his summer cottage in Ridgeway, Ontario. And we never knew why. We just were told in the AP, we learned in the Associated Press story that this neighbor had tried to uh, 
um, run over Monsignor Kelleher and um, with a car, with a car. And then the Monsignor, you know, they got out, they started fighting the allegation from this fellow who reached out to us was that the Monsignor was fooling around with the man's wife. And the, the police uh, very opaquely referred to it as a neighbor dispute back in the late 1950s when it occurred. And now another individual who spoke very highly of the Monsignor and said he, he, he this gentleman emailed me and he, he produced letters from the Monsignor to him. And he was a boxer, this fellow. And uh, he said that the Monsignor could draw the line with young fellows at the old Buffalo working boys home. If, if some of these fellows were acting up or in today's lingo acting out, the Monsignor would take off his Roman collar and pull them into the boxing ring and square up the matter right away so that the uh, individual would behave properly. There's no question that while the Monsignor might have been beloved and well-respected, there was a very dark side to him, a violent side. And uh, as I, as we have said, it would have taken two very strong men to have pulled Monsignor O'Connor, who weighed over 200 pounds, was more than six feet in height, from that car on the side of the highway, and, and then rolled him down the steep embankment into the creek where his body would later be found. You just wouldn't have some a uh, diminutive individual doing that. It took somebody, you know, rough and tough to, to pull dead weight, essentially. But who properly places a dead man's hat and tucks his eyeglasses into the hat and places it on a guardrail, you know, before rolling the murder victim into the creek? I mean, it's just, it, it doesn't fit the MO of a regular of criminals that uh, that 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 mug people. It just the, there's too much that's different here. And the fact that I know I'm going back here. Last point: the fact that his car was found over a mile away, parked in an upscale part of town. The doors were left open, and how wonderful! The key to the engine was in the sun visor. How very thoughtful. That does not sound like some kids out for, uh, you know, to pick on a, you know, a, a, a Catholic priest. That they would have like, kept the car. They would have kept the Dr- car. Driven too. away in it. Yeah. Going yeah. on a joy ride. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's not messy enough. It, it's <laughs> right. precisely. Too much care. Yeah. Pre- precisely not. Sure. With all sure. that said, Nat, we, we do not want to make it sound like we know who killed Monsignor, because we still don't. We just know what the most likely evidence points to, but we do not know really what happened. Right. I mean, just the just the three names brought up. So we've got Robert Arm Bruster, who you guys spent a lot of time kind of going into his past and uh, what ultimately happened with him. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, we've got Father Lewandowski, who we've talked about, and then uh, Monsignor Kelleher, who you guys just kind of went into, uh, which I want to touch on really quick, just to recap, he was kind of the unofficial disciplinarian for the Buffalo Diocese, right? Uh, but the thing that I kind of want to just hop into really quick before we get any further, go back to Robert Armbruster, is as far as Monsignor Kelleher goes, uh, you talked to a couple gentlemen who remember him differently uh than just being that disciplinarian right we talked to two former um golden gloves boxers who knew monsignor kelleher when they were teenagers and they they had the highest possible compliments for him they said that he took them under under his wing when they were at difficult times in their lives they were teenagers they were from broken homes and they said that he he was really a role model to these young teen these teenage boys who who came from very messed up situations. And uh, the one gentleman we spoke to, his name is Ed Neiman, and he he went on to have a tremendous career in the Buffalo Police, and now he's in the local sheriff's department. 
and a very uh, well-respected police officer. And he said that Monsignor Kelleher was one of the most important role models in his life. So, I mean, there's definitely multiple sides to this man. I mean, and we don't, we, we do not ignore that in our stories that, that he was well regarded by many people in the community. Many people looked at him as a hero in this community. I think that's what makes this all the more confusing. Cause if you got, yep. you've got these names and you've got these characters and it seems very split down the middle, like their personalities, the good with the bad. And it's just more of a head scratcher. At least well, that's what... if, if you work as a news reporter for 45 years, like Lou and I have, you, you will definitely meet many people who had pristine, tremendous reputations in the community who also had a dark side. And I've had, I worked in police, Buffalo police headquarters on and off for more than 20 years. And I can remember one police officer that I, um, trusted completely. He helped me with stories. He had been a hero at times. Um, he had won awards for heroism. And then one day I found out that he was um, he was on the take from drug dealers and drug dealers were paying him big sums of money. He ended up going to prison. So you meet people with, with multi-faceted backgrounds in this job. Which is all the more disappointing. Yeah. People happens. people only show what they want other people to see. Let's get into Bishop McNulty right now. We've, uh, in this podcast and in our articles, it's been repeated over and over and over again. The question as to why this inv- investigation was stopped, uh, went to complete halt, and seems to be, you know, we can only speculate on why this is, but it's, would it be fair to say that uh, taking a look at Bishop McNulty would be a good place to start? as to understanding maybe why this was all stopped. Bishop McNulty, going back to what we were just saying, I mean, he had a very positive uh, image in the community. He was a very um, religious, pious man, um, at least from all appearances, uh, a good leader for the Buffalo Catholic Diocese. But then as time goes on, we, we learn other things about him. He There was a, an incident where... Um, a young boy who was his paper boy delivered papers to the bishop's home, and uh, he's quoted in one of our stories. He, when he was about ten years old, he told the bishop that there was a priest that molested him, and the the bishop told him he was very sorry about that, and he was upset, appeared to be upset by it, and he said, "I am going to look into this for you. I'll take care of it." And he gave the paper boy a $5 tip, which was a huge sum of money in the 1960s for a 10-year-old kid. Well, time goes on, and this this priest who was accused of molesting this boy, nothing happened to him. His career went on. He was a successful pastor and monsignor for many years. He had a long career as a priest, and he was never there was never any punishment of this Monsignor. And postscript to the story is, about five years ago, this Monsignor, Monsignor Harrington, that the boy had accused, after all these decades later, was named by the Buffalo Catholic Diocese as a credibly accused molester of children. And this was long after the priest died. And the guy who made this complaint, who is now I believe he's in his 50s or his 60s. I interviewed him some time ago. He said, I don't believe the bishop did one thing for me after he promised he would look into that. One other story, when the bishop became very ill, I believe it was in the early 70s, Bishop McNulty, he was basically on his deathbed in his hometown in New Jersey. This was for several weeks, maybe a month, he was on his deathbed. One of the priests who came there, one of his best friends, came there and prayed by his bedside for at least two weeks, was a priest who much later would become one of these credibly accused molester of children. So, And and according to the the diocese itself, the the molestations began in the 60s when McNulty was bishop. So these things raise a lot of questions about our bishop. 
And, uh, and also Bishop McNulty, he was involved in a number of controversies while he was bishop with his own priests. He did not like any priest to be questioning any of the teachings of the Catholic Church or the Pope. A group of seven priests once uh, the Pope at the time put out a statement that um, artificial birth control was was a sin, and seven priests put out a statement disagreeing with that. They were all punished very severely by the bishop. They were removed from, oh, okay, yeah, and he also removed uh, priests that did not agree with his version of Catholic doctrine from the seminary that was in East Aurora. He was a powerful guy. Very much. The hierarchy of things here. We can't definitively say that he put a stop to Monsignor O'Connor's murder investigation, but would it be fair to say that this guy, Bishop McNulty, was definitely able to handle things that he didn't like or people that weren't acting the way that he liked, right? That's to summarize all of this. I can say that he was a very, very powerful person in Buffalo at that time. And all of the leaders of the Buffalo Police Department, the city of Buffalo mayor, and the district attorney all were Catholic men. And the bishop would, in my opinion, based on our extensive research, the bishop would have had the ability to to make them stop any kind of investigation. And we also have cred, uh, very credible sources that told us that that two of the top investigators who worked on the murder case told them that the bishop stepped in and, and asked city officials to stop the investigation, and they did it. And I personally believe that it did happen based on very credible statements made by credible people. And the Bishop McNulty's uh, personal scheduling book, his calendar book, still exists. The diocese has it. And the Catholic diocese spokesman told us there's no mention of him ever meeting with homicide chief Leo Donovan. And yet Leo Donovan told other another individual that he met with the bishop and asked the bishop five questions, and he felt that the bishop was lying on all of the questions. And there's never any mention in this appointment book, or the diocese claims is no other types of correspondence uh, involving the police investigating one of its priests in the murder of Monsignor O'Connor. And that, that priest was uh, Father Lewandowski who ultimately left the diocese. He was, quote unquote, according to the Buffalo diocese, transferred to the Ogdenburg diocese. It's a neighboring diocese up in the Adirondacks. And uh, Lewandowski was tucked up there in a very remote community, Tupper Lake, where he was for a number of months until he decided he'd had enough and left the priesthood and came back to Buffalo, where he would eventually die. There are two different, uh, uh, Nat, there are two different reports in the official Buffalo homicide uh, uh, file on this case that report that detectives had specific conversations with the bishop's office. Now, it would seem very strange to me that someone in the Buffalo homicide squad would make that up. Why would you say, you know, we talked to the bishop's office? And they told us that the bishop gave the okay to fingerprint and photograph Father John Lewandowski. It would seem bizarre beyond belief that a Buffalo detective would take it upon himself to make up that story back in 1966. And yet the diocese tells us today that there are no records of the bishop's office having any communication of any kind with any police or city official regarding this investigation. Yeah, I, I do go ahead. I, I do believe that the, the bishop's specialty was damage control. That one of his main goals was to protect the reputation of the Catholic Church, which is a real contrast to today, where you will hear clergy saying, I'm a sinner like you. You know, the church 
does seem much more accessible today to average people. But back then, when Father Lewandowski, who ultimately would be credibly accused of abusing young young ch- children, boys, uh, he wound up transferred all the way over to, to the Ogdenburg, uh, Ogdenburg Diocese. And usually back in the 60s, when a lot of this was going on, if a bishop Pardon me. If a priest was accused in one parish, they would transfer him to another parish somewhere in the in the diocese. So McNulty had to it 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 was highly unusual for a priest to be transferred from one diocese to another. But the bishop in the Ogdensburg diocese was McNulty's former right-hand man, his auxiliary bishop, Stanley Brazanus. And in order for a transfer to occur, both the bishop of the sending diocese and the bishop of the receiving diocese have to agree. And so that's how that was handled among acquaintances. And it ultimately didn't work out. But we did interview people up in Tupper Lake. And don't you know it? Lewandowski's in a bowling league with people and uh, with, with younger people, and he at least went to one underage drinking party, according to uh, an individual in Tupper Lake. We had a lot of assistance there from different people who, rec- who, re- who remembered their teenage years back at, in, the late 1970, in the late 1960s to when he was there. He was there for a brief time in 1969, several months. And they do recall him showing up at an underage drinking party. And you, you think that at that point, he would have learned his lesson. But, you know, he was <laughs> most likely a sociopath in addition no to be, being a credibly accused pedophile priest. Yeah. I mean, old habits die hard, uh, disgusting ones at that. And mm. people don't really change. I, I, I'm somewhat surprised if like uh yeah if somebody could see my face right now but i'm also not just that's all of that um and, and just thanks for bringing up all of that i think it's um between dan mentioning just to backtrack a second about uh the, realistically no one in the buffalo police department was going to lie about such a prominent figure uh, like talking to Bishop McNulty, uh, that kind of probably goes without saying, but just the, you guys bringing up the day planner thing and how that was so conveniently left out something. So <laughs> it's just like, you would think yeah. meeting with Leo Donovan at one o'clock Wednesday afternoon, would have made it in there. 18th, uh, 1966. Right. Uh-oh. You would think something like that, but because it's not there, what does that say? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You, you think might, it matters. might have been very specifically left out of there. Precisely. Mm-hmm. What are you going to put in your day planner? Met with Buffalo police, ordered them to shut down murder investigation. <laughs> you know, uh, it's the kind of thing you don't put on the day planner. This was just a question that popped up in my head with you guys talking. And, you know, we're looking at the last two articles of this whole series. And you guys choose to... Spend an entire article talking about Arm Bruster and his past and what happened after being a suspect and all of that. It seems an interesting choice for you guys to spend your final or, you know, second to last article with well, so much it, time on yeah, him. Right. Arm Bruster and what happened to uh, Lewandow- Father Lewandowski yes. as well. But, you, you know, something that I think speaks well of the fairness that we tried to uh, carry out through these stories is I have an email in front of me from Bill Armbruster, who, like his brother Robert, was a journalist. And uh, he said he starts it off: "My compliments to you and Dan Herbeck, along with Watchdog editor Michael Mc- Mike McAndrew, on a fine series of articles, as well as your editors for allowing so much time to be spent on the investigation." And I do think we were very fair with. Robert Armbruster, but we had to go back to him because of the outrageous 
things that police recorded from him in their interview with him. One, that uh, he had romantic feelings for Monsignor O'Connor, and two, he had fantasies of putting an axe in Monsignor O'Connor's head. You know, that I don't remember ever wanting to uh, inflict violence on an editor. I think every reporter gets angry when things don't go their way sometimes, or they have a position that they feel something should be in the story. But I, I, I don't think homicide is on our minds. And so, yeah, it was very important to go back to him. And he did, from all intents and purposes, lead a law-abiding life. He traveled over to the Philippines. He was an expert on Vatican II. He would lecture in the seminaries over there. And he also spent decades as a copy editor at the Newark Star Ledger. In, in fact, one of our former copy editors here had worked at the Star Ledger and said that, you know, Bob was a quiet fellow, but, but friendly enough. You know, he always had a smile on his face. And his brothers said that, you know, he was a gentle person and he really never discussed his time in Buffalo after he left, just that it was a bad time. And he took when he came when he returned home to New Jersey, he, he took care of his elderly parents. And because of him, they did not have to go into a nursing home. So that does speak very well of him. And when he died, there were hundreds of people at the funeral. He was known as the mayor of the little town that he resided in. And uh, yeah, he worked at the soup kitchen, served meals, you know, there it just seems he was very devoted. Was he making a life of amends there? I don't know. I do know that he was never not uh, dismissed, uh, exonerated completely as a suspect. They continued to wait for fingerprint returns on him that didn't match the fingerprints in the Monsignor's car. And they checked his uh, Army National Guard foot locker over at the Maston Armory in Buffalo. And uh, there's nothing that says in the, any of those files that he, he had been cleared, even though there were hints of it by Chief Dagenhart. So um, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Nat, as reporters, you go where the facts lead you. And Lou did that particular story that you were talking about. And Lou wanted to find out, we both wanted to find out what kind of lives did these two men lead after they were became suspects in this murder investigation. And from everything Lou and I, Lou could find out, Armbruster led a very honorable life after this incident and after the O'Connor murder. Lou also made numerous attempts to talk to uh, Father Lewandowski's family, even to the point that, that they got mad at Lou for trying to get their side of the story. They said, we don't want to talk about him. And Lou said, well, we would just like to hear somebody from the family give us the family's point of view. And they they absolutely would not talk to Lou. And they said, we're not talking about Father John. So that's where it led us. And that's what we wrote. What we would have loved to finish the series with would be a story tying up the whole mystery and saying exactly who did it how it was done and why it was done. Unfortunately, we couldn't write that story, partly because there's so many reports missing from the Buffalo police file on this. And so many people that were involved in the investigation are now deceased. So that's why we ended things the way we did. And let me just add, we hope we have not written the last chapter on this story. We are still looking in the tips and we are both convinced that there's somebody out there that if they have a mind to, could tell us exactly what happened. Sharon Battini, the oldest living relative of Fran O'Connor, she called him Uncle Fran. I had asked her, you know, if the killer is still alive and happens to read this series, do you have a message for him? And so Fran had said that... Uh, I hope you have suffered all these years knowing what you did. Sharon Bottini still desperately wants justice for her uncle, who she said was a gentle man, a scholar, who just loved being a, a man of the cloth. And 
that's how your series or at this time, that's how it ends. And when I finished with that line that, that you guys put in, the one you just mentioned that Sharon said, you know, her words to uh, the killer if they're still around, it just really was so blaring to me how this is sad. It is sad that that family just, they they have about, or they had as much information, probably even less than what we have now. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lou, but I yeah. think Sharon told you that she learned more from you about the investigation than she ever learned from the police. That is correct. And she was a little leery at first. She lives out of state, you know, and I'm calling her and trying to get insights from her. And it took a, it took a while because it's a very sad chapter in the O'Connor family. So where where do you guys go from here? As you look back on all these articles and your investigation and where things are today, where do we go from here? We, we, we interviewed the Erie County District Attorney yesterday, and the long and the short of it is he says unless he gets new evidence, he will not be able to proceed any further. He said it's a cold case and it's technically still open, but he needs evidence, new evidence. And the problem is most of the people are deceased. And he's very disappointed that the physical evidence was destroyed because that could have yielded DNA samples. And, you know, with Ancestry.com and genealogy today, who knows where that would have taken police. And so he's frustrated in some respects. But when we asked him if it's possible that somebody sanitized the police files and removed documents, he said, I won't dismiss anything. And then... I asked him if he was going to, you know, seek a uh, subpoena to the diocese for any information on the murder, on Lewandowski and O'Connor. He said that ethically he couldn't do that at this point because it would be like a fishing expedition. He needs some kind of proof before he can move forward. So I said to him, put aside your professional perspective and the ethics and rules that you have to follow for the, uh, you know, to commence a criminal proceeding. And what did you think of it? He is a very devout Catholic, John Flint. He goes to daily mass and he strikes me as an extremely sincere man who, you know, loves his job. And uh, I said, so as a as as just a human being, not a prosecutor, how do you feel about this? series. And he said, it raised eyebrows. And I asked him to be specific on that. And he said, I'm not going to get into that because he didn't want it to bleed over into, because he said, maybe somebody will come forward in six months from now. And so the door is wide open. And, but we do have all of these people who mentioned different suspects and these people are elderly and, uh, you know, they, they were, their attorneys, one was a judge, uh, one was an assistant DA. They're, they're credible individuals. But for this to go into a court of law or to have some kind of a legal finding, the standard is so much higher. So will the this, this series of stories that we worked on for a year lead to justice for the Monsignor? I don't know, but I do know that it has shined a glaring light on sh- many shortcomings. And that we, we've had, at least I've had a number of people say to me, why did you spend all that time looking at a murder case that's 60 years old almost? And why, you know, what's the point? I said, well, it's always worthwhile to go back and look at the way something like this was handled because... You would hope that the leaders of today would learn from the mistakes that were made 57 years ago. And I do think they 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 would have learned because I can tell you that the media learned from that because we believe that that the media in Buffalo at that time didn't raise questions. They never asked Buffalo police what's going on with this investigation. Why did it suddenly stop? We think the media was was also to blame for this cover-up because they didn't pursue it. And I can tell you that that would never happen today because, you know, in Buffalo, our newspaper and the, the TV stations, 
and there's a, a news station in town, they would have raised questions about this. They would they would not have let this get swept under the rug the way it was 57 years ago. We did have one priest who in last Sunday's bulletin spoke about our series. And it's amazing what he wrote. I mean, he didn't come to me with his bulletin. A tipster came and I verified it. And he said, I would speculate the investigation was probably stopped by Bishop McNulty in conjunction with high-ranking local officials. In that era in the church, it was of the utmost importance to keep the church free from scandal. And then he concludes, imagine the depth of filth that would allow someone to be murdered and then have the investigation called off. It continues, but I, I thought to myself, that raised my eyebrows. Uh, yeah, that is from a Sunday bulletin that people yeah. pick up at, after mass. From a pastor, yeah. Okay, just because just people may not understand. Yeah, and a pastor who's been around for decades and is respected. Wow. In capital letters. <laughs> That's, yeah. That would have been something. That came in an email to you? from. from well, someone? I was tipped off in a mm-hmm. phone call, and then I was able to get a copy of the bulletin. <laughs> That's that's nuts and kind of maybe a little bit gratifying. I don't want to speak for you guys, but yeah, yeah, you guys did important work and definitely Dan's dad said it very well. It's a it's a learning lesson on what not to do. Don't be complicit or complacent, you know, whether it be the media or whoever's investigating a, a case such as this. But um, yeah, it's still kind of um. Uh, I, I, I wish you I wish you guys had that article that tied up everything up perfectly. Uh, and I wish your investigation did end that way. But look, here we are. We're looking for someone who have, may have worked at Sisters Hospital in Buffalo during the year 1966, because without giving the details, I apologize, I can't. But someone who worked in the emergency room back in 1966 might hold the key to this mystery and we hope that that person or persons will contact Lou or I. I did you imagine all these things coming up and how, how this thing has evolved? Could no. you have pictured this a year and a half ago? No, the, you know and I I I do commend the uh admin, police administration of the former Buffalo Police Commissioner Byron Lockwood and his administration which made it possible for us to get this file, the complete file of what does still exist that Dan was unable to get in a foil filed by Maki Becker, a colleague of ours several years earlier. Uh, I think they recognized that there was an old boys network. And uh, so the, the, the bottom line is Monsignor Francis J. O'Connor deserves justice. And maybe this gives some measure of justice in the court of public opinion. Amen. That's a soundbite of the year, Lou. I like that. That's what more can you say? Not much. That's it for now. Thanks to Dan and Lou from Buffalo News on this Who Killed the Monsignor series. Make sure you subscribe to Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles wherever you get your podcasts. See you later.